deal with Iran. Uh, look, most of the media attention, of course, and a lot of policy attention has been in recent weeks on Gaza uh, and the conflict between uh, Hamas and Israel, and uh, that's uh, for good reason. But uh, somewhat lost, I think, in all the in that in that focus has been the fact that uh, just about a little over a week ago, uh, Iran and the uh, P5 plus one po uh, powers, uh, the, the members of the, next, uh, the UN Security Council and um, and Germany, uh, agreed to extend uh, their talks another four months uh, to November 24th. Just to give you a little back, just to, uh, everyone should recall, sorry, we're just adding some more chairs, uh, is the fact that uh, we, um, was, there was an interim deal. It was essentially negotiated in November last year. It was finalized in January, on January 20th. There was a six month deadline to reach a comprehensive deal, and that expired on July 20, on July 20th, a week ago Sunday, yesterday. And, uh, and then there was, a, and, uh, there was a, but, but in the deal was the idea that uh, in this interim deal, uh, the joint plan of action, there was also, there was in there embedded in there was that it could be extended. So it was extended four more months. Uh, we're going to talk, so what we're going to do today is uh, assess the last six months and also kind of assess where we go from here heading into uh, November 20th. Uh, before I introduce the panelists, I just want to also mention we have outside in the front uh, just a very small little report that the task force has. Uh, the uh, Jinsa's had a task force on Iran uh, since uh, for a little over a year now, for about 15 months. We've put out, as you know, a number of reports and op-eds, and we've had a number of events, and obviously we have uh, discussions with uh, government officials. We put out something uh, the week before July 20th, pretty uh, that just lays out called proving the prospects for an acceptable final deal with Iran. But out before July 20th, we pretty much saw that there wasn't going to be a comprehensive deal uh, on July 20th. And I'll just highlight a few of the bullet points. Of course, there's more detail in the report. Um, we call for conditioning further sanctions. We we say that actually. Uh, uh, Iran is less like has been feels less compelled now than it did say seven eight nine months ago to conclude a final deal given uh, the joint plan of action and we recommend conditioning further sanctions relief on dramatic rollback of Iran's nuclear program. Uh, we call for Congress and the Obama administration to work much more closely on negotiating and implementing. A final deal, in other words, that the administration just shouldn't negotiate this with itself without any coordination, any approval of Congress. Augmenting both U.S. and Israeli military options, and we give a few examples of that. Working more closely with our regional allies on this, and obviously some of our allies, the Israelis and some of our Arab allies, haven't felt like they've really been consulted properly on this, so we, we call for closer uh, coordination with our allies in the region in our negotiations with Iran. Uh, also, interdicting clandestine Iranian arms exports to the Middle East. Now, we have a, uh, a really excellent panel, as always, I'd say. Uh, members of our Iran task force, including the two co-chairs, uh, Ambassador Eric Edelman, he's former uh, Undersecretary of Defense for Policy in the George, uh, under George W. Bush, former Ambassador of Turkey, um, and, and elsewhere. Uh, he's currently a distinguished fellow at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessment. He's also the Roger Hurtock Distinguished Practitioner and Resident at the Fellow Merrill Center for Strategic Studies at, at, at SAIS. I won't spell out SAIS for, for the sake of brevity. Uh, in, in, uh, Ambassador Eric Edelman, who also co-chairs over there, are, are uh, the task force who is special assistant uh, to President uh, Obama and National Security Council Senior uh, Director for the Central Region. He is currently a distinguished fellow and counsel at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. To his right is Steve Rademacher, uh, another member of our task force and he's a senior advisor to our uh, Gemunder Center uh, for Defense and Strategy. Uh, he was also 
uh, perhaps less uh, well known than being senior advisor S. He's also uh, was former assistant secretary of state for international security and non-proliferation under President George W. Bush. He is currently the principal of the Podesta Group. And finally, Ray Paquet, also a member of the Iran, our Iran Task Force, is currently a senior fellow for Middle East Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. He was a senior advisor on Iran at, at the State Department and the Obama administration, and is author of many articles, uh, many books, of course, and op-eds on Iran. And before we just commence, I just want to recognize a few folks in the audience. Uh, first and foremost is uh, Joel Gamunder, who's the uh, benefactor uh, the primary benefactor of the Gamunder Center for Defense and Strategy. Um, and uh, also Michael Nachman is chairman of JINSA and Mori Amitai is the vice chairman of JINSA. And uh, it's great to have all you, uh, particularly Joel, I had to travel farther to get here, so it's great to have you, Joel. Uh, all right, so why don't we begin and I'll turn it over to our moderator. Uh, Okay. Uh, so, uh, so uh, we're still a small organization. You have to wear a few different hats. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start with Ambassador Ross Dennis. Uh, before we get into the we get deep into the Iran issue, I think Gaza is dominant in a lot of the news. I do think I'd like to get your thoughts, uh, just to get your thoughts of how you see things there certainly particularly about administration policy uh, uh, towards this conflict. Well, look, I think everyone would like to see this conflict end. Everyone would like to see uh, the suffering end. I think it's important not only that we end it, but it's important to think about how it ends so that it isn't just uh, a pause and basically it becomes a basis to produce the next round. It's clear that the Israelis were surprised by the scope of the tunnels. They look at the tunnels as being the equivalent of a loaded gun at their head. I mean, you want to hear me as well? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I think the if you if you look at uh, when the when the Egyptians made their ceasefire proposal. The Israelis accepted, the Arab League accepted it, uh, and Hamas didn't accept it. That was at a point before the Israelis knew the scope of the tunnels. Not only do they now know that they were surprised by the scope of the tunnels, but they also know that every one of the tunnels they discovered had an outlet next to a uh, kibbutz, a village, uh, a town in Israel. And that from the interrogations, they also know that there were plans for a massive, simultaneous attack through the tunnels. So there is complete consensus in Israel, I mean, complete consensus in Israel, left to right, that this can't end without the tunnels being fully destroyed. The Hamas made a massive investment in the tunnels. Uh, it is true that getting materials into Gaza has not always been easy, but it's also true that whatever materials they got, Hamas was interested not in building Gaza or in helping the people of Gaza, but in building uh, an underground labyrinth of tunnels whose purpose was to infiltrate into Israel, to carry on a war against Israel, to protect the Hamas leadership and provide for command control for it, uh, and to be able to uh, launch rockets against Israel. So, you know, they. They were very much focused on how they maintained the war against Israel. They were not at all concerned about development within Gaza. Any outcome cannot be an outcome where they're free to rebuild. Uh, there has to be an outcome where you're going to deal with not just the humanitarian needs of Gaza, but I would say the developmental needs of Gaza. What are the safeguards that are going to be created that will ensure that they can't just rebuild. I would like, I would like to see a Marshall Plan for Gaza. I would like to see the United States lead that, and I would like it to be conditioned uh, on, at a minimum, all the rockets, all the tunneling uh, has to end. And there have to be safeguards to ensure that the materials that go in to Gaza are used for the purposes they're intended. If that's not the case, any investment in Gaza is going to be held hostage to the next round. 
I can't imagine why there'd be massive investment in Gaza if it just can be destroyed in the next round when Hamas chooses that it's time for them to have the next round. So you know, I think it's very important to, uh, to focus on how to end this, but ending it also has to be connected to some kind of a strategic focus as well. And I would say, again, you have an interesting strategic reality in the region. If you read the press in the Gulf states, and Egypt, they are obviously critical of Israel. That's not a surprise because there's a lot of Palestinians who are getting killed. But they're also very critical of Hamas for what Hamas is doing to the Palestinian people. We should take account of how the strategic landscape in the region seems to reflect, again, this reality of A, preoccupation with Iran on the one hand and the Muslim Brotherhood on the other. And knowing that that's the strategic landscape, that should inform our policy. And I was, I'll pause there because I think Eric wants to say something about the rockets. Bear in mind two things, and then I, this will be my hand over to you. Uh, the long range rockets that Hamas has came from Iran in violation of Security Council resolution. Uh, and the know how for how to build the rockets came from Iran. So, you know, at the same time that you're engaging in negotiations with the Iranians on the nuclear issue, which I favor. And I've said this before, if they're prepared to do all these things in the region, ship arms and promote trouble everywhere and problems everywhere, we should compete with them everywhere in the region. If they can talk and do that at the same time, we can talk with them and compete with them at the same time, including interdicting their, sh their shipments of arms. Eric? Well, I, <clears throat> I agree with much of what Dennis just said. I, I did want to comment on one aspect of this that I do think links um, the, what's going on uh, today in Gaza and Israel with the topic of our panel, which is the Iranian uh, ballistic missile program. Uh, Iran is the only country in the world, I believe, and I, I think this is accurate, that has tested uh, missiles at um, the kind of long ranges they have tested them without having a nuclear warhead to put on them. Um, and for that reason, um, U.S. negotiators in the background that they've done on the recently concluded uh, round and, and uh, laying the groundwork for understanding the extension uh, have acknowledged that the uh, ballistic missile program needs to be addressed. Um, so far, Iran has essentially refused to uh, address it, and it's not really touched in the current plan of action other than to indicate that it has to be addressed at some point. Um, the uh, negotiators, understandably, uh, have said that it needs to be, uh, in this context, that is the negotiation about the nuclear program, seen in its nuclear light. Uh, I would just make the point, and this, I think uh, is consistent with what Dennis just said, that uh, even absent a nuclear program, the scale and scope of Iran's conventional ballistic missile capability is extremely disturbing and is a, a threat to the uh, balance of power in the region. Uh, and to uh, many long-standing U.S. allies above and beyond Israel, it will continue to be a threat to Israel, but it, uh, above and beyond Israel, it will also be a threat to other allies in the region. And I agree with Dennis, they share the occupation with the Muslim Brotherhood and with Iran. Do you have any other? Ray, do you have, uh, just speaking, okay, I won't go into the nuclear. Uh, thank you, Dennis and Eric, on that. Um, Let's, uh, let's talk about getting to the, uh, the Iran nuclear negotiation. Um, first, Ray, I'm going to start with you, actually. Uh, why don't you just explain what you see are the key points of the, uh, of, of the, deal, uh, of the extension and uh, how you see then with, with the, Iranian, uh, the Iranian perspective. Uh, sure, thanks. Uh, everyone can. Everyone who wants to can hear me. Uh, I would say uh, one of the most critical events actually took place September of 2013 when the Supreme Leader gave a speech sort of outlining his essential red lines and his red lines were that no facility would close, nuclear material would now leave the country. If you recall, there was a time when people used to talk about swap deals where Iran would send this enriched uranium abroad for reprocessing. And he also implied that there'll be no suspension. Uh, which is mandated by Security Council resolutions. Uh, 
since then, everything that has happened has conformed to those essential red lines. Joint plan of action conforms to those red lines. Uh, and I think the Iranian position today remains that particular, it nestled in that particular red line, those particular red lines. And I think that's essentially the conflict between the two sides uh, regarding Iran's enrichment capacity and the pace of sanctions relief. And according to the briefings that foreign ministers at EPA, they also have continued disagreements over the Iraq heavy water facility. Uh, the joint plan of action that had built in it uh, the ability to extend for six months was extended. I don't think anybody has a problem with that extension, but again, I would pose the question that I posed earlier in written form. Tell me what happens in the next four months that didn't happen in the last six months. What changes? Uh, it is important to suggest that U.S. international communities negotiations with Iran over its disputed nuclear program are 11 years old. They're not six months old. They began in 2003. Uh, and a variety of modalities and variety of personalities. It's, 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 it's like the longest running so far brought there. It's, it ran so long that the current cast is the original cast. Uh, is that even a Roman where they're present at the creation? Uh, Ray, I'm sorry, but before we get to the next four months, but I just want to make sure we understand what's happened so far and how you see where Rouhani's position, the, the president, and how this deal has uh, been portrayed in Iran and, and so on. Before we get. Strangely enough, President Rouhani doesn't speak much about it. Uh, the Supreme Leader speaks about it, the Foreign Minister Zavi speaks about it because he has to do the briefings and all that. Uh, they have, the Foreign Minister Zarif in his briefing to Parliament made four points. Number one, he said that the purpose of the Iranian program, as has been conveyed to 5 plus 1, is to have an industrial size program, not a symbol. He said, we have told them that and they know that. He said the negotiations are now, we're not playing games in negotiations. We start with no, we end with no. There's no, we're not taking positions to be an angle. And uh, third position he made is that when the Supreme Leader has talked about 190,000 centrifuges and so on, the 5 plus 1 delegation knew about that because that was the position that we had So his position is that we keep what we have, and after the duration of the sunset calls, we expand to an industrial size program. And he always mentioned that the purpose of this is an industrial size program. Steve? Uh, I'd like to, you to give what you see as the, from the perspective of, of the U.S. Uh, about this. How, how do you assess the last six months? Um, and maybe some things we might have learned from that. Um, well, I, mean, I, I think we have confirmation that the Iranians are hard negotiators. Um, they, as Ray suggested, they, they um, identify their red lines up front and they are pretty good about sticking to them. And um, the, you know, the, the key red lines that they outlined are, you know, have to do with the, the size of their program and um, their, their end game. Uh, in truth, I think they won a lot of the most important victories at the very outset. Um, in the joint plan of action itself. Um, prior to the joint plan of action, uh, it had been the position of, of, of the U.S. government and others that there should, there should be just speak up the that there should be no enrichment in Iran, or at, at a minimum that, that enrichment in Iran should be suspended. In fact, that was a requirement of, of uh, uh, multiple uh, UN Security Council resolutions that were passed and, and were, or, as a matter of international law, binding on Iran. But the joint plan of action. Um, well, perhaps technically, technically not recognizing a legal right to enrich in Iran, does say that Iran is going to be able to keep enriching. So uh, essentially that was a victory for the Iranians. Um, on the issue of sanctions, that there have been a lot, of, a lot of momentum in the direction of tightening sanctions. Uh, that momentum was arrested by the, uh, the Joint Plan of Action. Um, and so now all the talk is about sanctions relief. And in fact, some sanctions relief is, is provided for in the Joint Plan of Action. Um, and then, most importantly, uh, is the question of the end game. Um, the, um, the, uh, there's sort of a misnomer in the, uh, in the Joint Plan of Action. They, they talk about how, what they're doing during the six month period, which has now been extended for an additional four months. They're negotiating what they call the final step of the comprehensive solution. And, and so that, that's what most of us have been focused on. How many centrifuges can they have? Uh, what's, the, what's the inspection? regime going to be, what, what limitations on the, the amount of material that they produce will, will apply. But the reason I say it's a misnomer is it's not actually the final step. The final step, as specified in the current plan of action, is that 
at the end of the process, Iran will be treated as a normal country in civil nuclear war. So they'll be treated just like Japan, just like Germany. Anything that other countries can do with their civil nuclear infrastructure, Iran is the key. And, and the, the Joint Plan of Action is quite clear that this final step of the comprehensive solution will have a limited duration. So it's not the permanent solution. It's actually just another interim solution leading to the permanent solution. And it's now agreed that the permanent solution is Iran is like everybody else. They basically, no matter what the history was, no matter what, what we later determined they've been up to in the past, at the end of the final step of the comprehensive solution, uh, Bygones will be bygones, and, and they can have the same sort of civil nuclear infrastructure that every other country in the world uh, that hasn't misbehaved is entitled to. And so then the key question is, well, how long will the, the final step of the comprehensive solution apply? Uh, and according to press reports, the, Iranians, the Iranian position is maybe three years, seven years, I mean, conflicting of course, but that, that's where they are. Uh, the Obama administration reportedly is something in excess of 10 years. Uh, I don't know how much, but you know, not, you know, given, that, given that this is a program that we've been arguing about now for 11 years, uh, sort of the outside is uh, maybe for another 10 or 11 years, uh, they'll be subject to some restrictions, but after that, uh, they can do whatever they want, uh, subject to normal inspections. And uh, that's a huge victory for the audience because uh, they, they could actually come, they haven't come clean, they haven't, seal the history of the program from the IAEA. But even if they revealed it and it was crystal clear, even if they admitted that they've been trying to produce nuclear weapons, uh, we are now locked into a, into a course here where after 10 years or whatever the agreed period is, uh, they get to be treated like a, a normal country, provided they don't cheat during that period. Uh, Dennis, you've been involved in negotiations with government for a long time. How do you assess the last six months or eight months? Well, I think I would pick up a point that, that Ray made. I think there it is it is worth asking um, what's going to be different in the next four months that was different in the past six. Uh, the fact is there's going to be some a, a little bit of more limited sanctions relief for them. I, I don't I think the administration is right that the architecture of the sanctions regime has held intact. There were those who claimed that it was all going to erode, and that didn't happen. And you could argue that that still gives the Iranians an incentive to want to see the sanctions lifted. But it's pretty clear at this point that they don't feel the kind of pressure that they need to feel if we're going to achieve what we want. The essence of the bargain that has always been there has been they roll back their program, we roll back the sanctions. And they made it very clear that they're offering something different. They're offering transparency uh, of some sort, basically based on the additional protocol. Uh, and in return for that transparency, we roll back the sanctions. Unless something changes to get us back to roll back for roll back, uh, and at this point, the dynamic that exists doesn't seem to suggest that, then you're not going to get the deal that we want. So I do think we have to find a way to increase the pressure on them between now and the end of the four-month period if we want the result to be something that fits this notion of rollback for rollback. So let me just, before I turn to Eric, I just want to just, I mean, you served in the uh, White House of the Obama administration on this issue. Given what you just said, do uh, you think the administration misunderstood or uh, 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 underestimated, overestimated its leverage, or frankly has just maybe, um, you know, a different way of approaching uh, diplomacy? Well, I, I do think that they, I think the administration has believed that by preserving the regime, the sanctions regime intact, that, that maintains their pressure on the Iranians and that the kind of relief that Iran feels they need and that those within Iran, I think the public want, will create will create the pressures that will lead the Iranians in the end to concede. Now that's a proposition to be tested. Based on the first six months, uh, you have to conclude at this point something more has to happen, I think. But the administration, I think, would argue that, you know, we've got certain things even in this agreement that suggests that we can get the Iranians to go farther, 
The Iranians are taking an additional step on half of the 20% they're gonna, that was oxidized. They're going to turn that into fuel assemblies. And that's a process that is difficult to reverse. So that shows that they're doing things that weren't necessarily predicted before. That would be, I think, the argument that the administration would make. I would, and I think, you know, that, that again, the proposition to be tested. I think what got the Iranians to the table in the first place was real pressure. And to get them to stake out a position that is different than the one they have now, you're going to have to have pressure that goes beyond what they're feeling today. I don't think the Iranians at this point feel the kind of pressure that would lead them to do a rollback or rollback. I think they, everything the, they're signaling suggests that they think they can get rollback for transparency. Eric, you want to please address those issues? Well, yeah. I, I mean, I agree with much of what, what Dennis said. I mean, uh, there's a kind of good news, I guess, bad news story here. I mean, the good news is that the IEA reports that they did last weekend that Iran is continuing to abide by the terms agreed in November of the Joint Plan of Action. Uh, in exchange for this pro rata of 2.8 billion, roughly, in sanctions relief that they get uh, as part of the extension, uh, they have taken some minor steps uh, down the of less than 2% uh, LEU, et cetera. Um, I think the administration is making a little bit more out of those steps to justify the extension that maybe is warranted, but at least uh, they've taken some steps. I think the real problem is that, as Dennis just suggested, the two sides uh, are, in some sense, continuing to talk past each other. Um, David Albright and Paul Hainan in uh, earlier uh, last week had an analysis that stressed exactly this point, that the uh, P5 plus one, or the P5 anyway, are looking for uh, constraints on uh, Iran's ability to break out, uh, reverse the reversibility of some of those constraints, uh, and adequate verification. And Iran is really focused on uh, cooperation and transparency, um, and basically saying, um, and this goes back to the point that Steve made at the end of the day, uh, you should trust us uh, that we what we say when we say we don't want to have uh, a, a nuclear weapon, despite the past military activities, the um, serious prevarication about the scope of their program over the years, et cetera. My fear here is, and this goes back again to what Dennis was saying, that absent something changing, if Iran was not willing to agree to something that actually rolls back its program, uh, as opposed to merely capping it as the joint plan of action does, you know, what what changes the dynamic? Um, you know, on the one hand, the administration acknowledges, senior officials have acknowledged in the background as they've done on the extension, that it was, in fact, the sanctions that Congress enacted that got us to this point. The paradox of that is, of course, the administration fought tooth and nail against those sanctions in almost every instance, sought, um, sought waiver authority to uh, to uh, cushion the impact of the sanctions, and currently argues that no more sanctions should be enacted despite uh, the pressures on the Hill uh, to do that. Um, what I worry about is that if you're the Iranians, you've already seen um, the Americans move quite a bit on a number of fronts. Um, and I think that was implicitly acknowledged by uh, former Secretary Clinton yesterday uh, on the Fareed Zakaria show when she said her view was there should be no enrichment or very, very little enrichment, which I think is Dennis's position as well. My, my concern is uh, it's hard to know because the talks remain sort of swaddled in Rubik's Cube, which is nothing's agreed until everything is agreed. But if you're the Iranian, you've seen a pattern of a shift of movement in your direction. Uh, while you have steadfastly refused to make any tangible concessions, those aren't my words, that's stated all right in Holly Hainan's words from their report last week. In light of that dynamic, why would you change what you've done up to this point? Let me pick up on that with you, Eric. Uh, what about reports? Uh, what do you think uh, where the U.S. position is right now? Like one of the big focuses have been, of course, on the number of centrifuges. 
based on like uh, uh, Robert Einhorn's piece uh, that he wrote a little while ago, and other reports of people think the administration has moved to 6,000 centrifuges. They have about 9,500 operating centrifuges. Uh, of course, the Supreme Leader talked about a hell of a lot more than that. Um, and uh, anyway, I'm just curious what you think, where the, you know, the, the administration position is right now. You know, I honestly, I don't know. Um, I'm always a little uh, reluctant to trust uh, reports in the press. I think one needs to be very careful about, about this. Uh, and in any event, the, as I said, I think the administration has covered itself by saying that nothing's agreed until everything's agreed. Therefore, one could argue that any position that has been forwarded or exchanged between the sides of the non-paper is not really a position until all the other pieces fall into place. My concern is really the larger pattern that I described a second ago, which is if the dynamic of the negotiation is that it has been the five who have moved more in the direction of Iran without Iran really giving up very much at all. If you're Iran, why do you want to change that dynamic? Why do you think the next four months will be any different? I'm also a little concerned about the form of this extension. Uh, the, the original joint plan of action called for a six-month extension and then the raised the possibility of an additional six-month extension. I don't want to be too cynical about it, but uh, the convenient four months going you know, coinciding with the actual date of the joint plan of action also, in my view, allows for an additional two months you know, for a further extension. Um, since I'm now I'm no longer in government and, and part of the professoriate, um, I'm, I'm very um, aware of the dangers of continuing to give your students an extension. <laughs> uh, let me, uh, I want to ask about the leverage a little more before we move forward about the next few months. Uh, Steve, um, just to clarify, on the joint, we've been talking about the leverage issues. Look, the, the Iranians have been given, these, uh, we've unfrozen some assets, another two and a half billion right now, roughly. They also are exporting a lot more oil uh, uh, than uh, the administration thought about a million, but the, in May it was a million and a half. I think in June it was like one, two, or one, three million barrels a day. And the Iranians, their concessions, are, 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 are they reversible what they've given up with their nuclear program, what they've done to their program in terms of the oxidation and reconversion? Yeah, uh, that, that's right. They've done nothing that, that was irreversible. They, they've taken their underground facility and said we, we will no longer enrich to uh, the higher 20% level uh, at that facility. Uh, but in doing that, they then switched to the production of the, the lower 3.5% enriched material. Um, they had a stockpile of 20% material, which they uh, essentially uh, needed to dispose of. Uh, which, which is positive, but um, that, that is also reversible, especially for that that's been oxidized, which is half of the 20% material. Uh, so and it does appear to be one of the red lines. They, they insist they will not dismantle anything they, they constructed. Um, it, it, maybe I'll just offer one comment here that goes to the previous question. Um, the it, it, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but. Um, Obviously, there's a discussion now about how many centrifuges Iran will be permitted to operate during the, this final, so-called final step. Uh, and um, the two sides have not reached agreement. Um, the, the Iranians are saying they want to basically keep operating everything that they've been operating. Um, and, and so far, the Obama administration has not said yes to that. Uh, but there, there is a new concept that's been introduced. Uh, instead of counting the number of centrifuges, another way to, to get at the same issue would be to limit um, essentially the amount of uh, enrichment that is done with the centrifuges. There, there's a unit of measurement called a separative work unit. I mean, it's a very complicated concept, but it's basically how much work are the, are the centrifuges doing in, in, with, with regard to enrichment. And you can measure this, and if you agree, you can. Because the idea is if whatever we say, say the Obama administration wants to allow a thousand centrifuges, you could compute what a thousand centrifuges would be able to do in terms of separate work units and, and adopt that as, as a ceiling. Uh, that sounds good, uh, but it's, it, it looks to me, I am suspicious of what they're doing is they're looking at this as a way to sort of bridge the gap, whatever the gap is between the two sides. Because um, say, 
you say, I, again, I don't know what the Obama administration position is, but if it's a thousand centrifuges and they converted that to the amount of work that a thousand centrifuges can do, um, Iran potentially could keep the 9,000, 9,500 centrifuges they have now, uh, just operate them less frequently um, over long periods of time, or, or they could, um, in fact, they could build additional centrifuges. Uh, they, could, they could expand their infrastructure. Uh, as long as the amount of enrichment they were doing with those centrifuges did not exceed the, the cap as measured in separate work units. And so what I think upon reflection, what appears to be a very clever solution that, that enables uh, the Obama administration to say we've got the equivalent of X number of centrifuges as a limit, and it enables the Iranians to say, well, we don't have to dismantle everything. We can, we can keep operating everything we have. Uh, the, the problem with that is, uh, it actually creates uh, an opportunity for Iran to do a lot more in terms of infrastructure development and, and it obviates any need on their part to dismantle anything. And then the, uh, their current separative work units or SWU roughly is about 10,000 and give or take. And uh, the Supreme Leader talked about how they ultimately need 190,000. Centrifuges, that, that's right. And you talk about centrifuges or SWU, I think? Well, I, I think. He says, he says, so, so he says 190,000. Okay. So they obviously have grander plans of how much output they're going to get from their uh, centrifuges. Well, I mean, you know, that, I'd say that's sort of a fundamental conceptual problem with the, the joint plan of action. If you, if you agree that Iran is going to be able to have centrifuges, keep centrifuges, operate them, do the R&D on centrifuges, to what end? Uh, and you know, the Iranian answer is, well, because we're setting up an enrichment industry. And for that industry to make any economic sense, it has to be pretty robust. And, uh, as an economic matter, they're absolutely right. If you, if you accept that they're going to be doing enrichment, uh, it makes no economic sense to do it at a very, very small level. Uh, at some point, they need to do exactly what the Supreme Leader has said they want to do. So uh, their position is not illogical. It follows from uh, the logic of the Joint Plan of Action. Ray, let me ask you, uh, we'll pick up on leverage issues, but Ray, let me ask you about, uh, about the oil exports. I mean, they were exporting about 800,000 barrels a day in October. Since November, when the deal was essentially agreed, although it wasn't formally codified in, in, uh, in, in, until January, they've averaged about 1.2 or 1.3 million barrels a day. The administration has said it should be about a million. Is all that money, the Iranians have access to all that money from those exports, uh, or where, where does all that money go? They issued a, a dispute, actually, and we don't know it. Uh, I, my guess is that money is, is it remains in the banks of China, and Japan, India, or Japan, and is subject to the same sort of a border trade that they've been doing, but I'm not sure. Uh, Iran's economy, according to IMF figures, and who knows how reliable IMF figures are, is supposed to grow at about 2%. I and mean, if you track it monthly, it's beginning to grow. Uh, but I think all these discussions about GDP growth and all that, is similar to the number of centrifuges, it assumes that the Iranian leadership are economic determinants. Uh, they kind of measure things. It's sort of American pragmatism in reverse, right? Uh, I'm, I'm sure there are people that are concerned about the economy and the revival of the economy, uh, but I'm not quite sure at the top leadership they're unhappy with the state of their economy. I mean. Uh, the thing about Ali Khamenei that's interesting is not so much that he's ideologue, but he's also old. Old leaders don't make dramatic changes. I mean, Elliot Abrams and I were talking about Brezhnev because that's what we do. We talk about Brezhnev. Uh, and Elliot was, uh, we were saying that Brezhnev knew what was wrong with the Soviet economy. He just couldn't fix it. Because old guys don't make dramatic changes in the way they do things. Uh, and the economy probably knows about the economy and its deficiencies, but he's happy just to kind of crawl along uh, with little growth, little spur, little incremental changes. I think Iran's economy is in deep structural problems, irrespective of the arms control. Uh, if they have the arms control, if those structural changes don't go away. But in terms of leverage, uh, I mean, this is not complicated. Obviously, we did not have sufficient leverage in Vienna to impose an agreement. You know how I know that? Because there was no agreement. 
Okay, I don't need to be an economist to figure this one out. Uh, if he had leverage, he would have gotten the agreement. Dennis, yeah, I want to please I have a couple comments just to keep the perspective. One, old leaders may not change, but he decided to allow Rouhani to win. So there was something going on that was problematic from his standpoint, because Rouhani's position was, you know, we're gonna, we got to end the sanctions, we got to end our isolation. Two, on the oil, again, you got to, you have to bear in mind the following. Some of the increase in oil is that they were sending more oil to Syria. Well, they're not getting paid for that. And some of the increase goes into accounts that they can't access. So just because we've seen some change, we have to keep that in some perspective. Having said what I just said, I, I do agree with, with Ray. If the leverage we had was sufficient, we'd have a deal. Now, the leverage, now it may be, you could argue that maybe we'll never have sufficient leverage. What some of us have felt is you can build leverage by being prepared to compete more actively in the region as a way of raising the cost. My view has been there's again a kind of hypothesis out there that the way to help people like Rouhani and Zareed is by not increasing the pressure right now, that allows them then to, to deliver something. And I would argue exactly the opposite. The only way that Rouhani and Zareed can deliver, and I take as a given that they have an interest not only in ending sanctions, they would like to normalize Iran's relationship with much of the rest of the world for their own reasons. They think it's in the interest of their country. But the only way they can deliver, given what is built in opposition from groups like the Revolutionary Guard, is to show the cost of what Soleimani does. Is to demonstrate if you want Iran to pay a terrible price economically, if you want Iran to be isolated, uh, then don't make any concessions and don't roll back your program. If you want things to change, then you're going to have to roll back your program. And I would add one other thing. If they thought that if diplomacy failed, Iran was going to pay a dramatically worse price, and we conveyed the message that you have a lot to lose from the failure of diplomacy, far more than we do, then the chances of an agreement would go up. If they thought at the end of the day if diplomacy failed, they'd not only face sanctions, but the huge investment they've made in this nuclear infrastructure could be lost because military action would be taken, your chances of a deal would be greater. The essence of force of diplomacy is to be in a position where the other side is convinced that the things they don't want you to do are going to happen. And at this point, I don't believe that that's the Iranian perception. I just say one, just very briefly, uh, about uh, Dennis and, and Eric and others have been in negotiations and strategizing negotiations. It seems to me when you're in negotiations with an adversary who's weakening, you increase the pressure, while at the same time giving them a way out. You say that you increase pressure, and when you give them a way out, you can define the parameters of that way out. The problem of having an interim agreement is it kind of relieves some of the pressure. And the second problem is, as Steve said, we have now stipulated contractually that an interim agreement would be replaced by another interim agreement of a different duration, obviously. But that this this whole thing seems to me rather conceptually yeah, just yeah, tactically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just to add to what Ray said, I mean, uh, I believe Foreign Minister Zarif has already said that you know the joint plan of action actually should be the comprehensive plan of action. Where where we are capping the program is where we're willing to go. Um, I think it was Napoleon who said there's nothing so uh, permanent as the provisional. Um, and I, I do think that um, part of the danger of the extension, and potentially a second extension, is that it conditions people to that outcome. Eric, let me pick up on, on the leverage issue uh, going forward, and then let's talk about, I think there's going to be consensus here that we have to increase the leverage over the next few months if we expect to get anything positive in, in November, uh, or a couple months after that, if it's extended further. Uh, we laid out in a report that the task force put out a couple uh, a couple weeks ago, a week and a half ago, steps we thought. And I was curious if you think, and Dennis brought up the issue of also threat of military action. I was curious just if you could articulate some things you think Congress or, other, or, or the uh, Obama administration needs to do to increase that pressure uh, because it seems like we, in our group, we've talked about sanctions, but we've also talked about 
uh, like augmenting Israel's capacity uh, to strike Iran, selling them certain you know bunker busters and uh, B-52s. How do you think we could change the calculus? And what should the focus of the debate be? Because I think that the fault is always just on sanctions here in Washington. Right, well, Mike, you kind of uh, answered the question in a way, because there are obviously some steps that we've already talked about that could be taken that would uh, both increase uh, Israel's uh, military capabilities. I mean, I would argue that we ought to be uh, also doing some things to, you know, that would um, transmit uh, you know, a better understanding of our military capabilities. Um, I was in the UAE not long ago, and I showed them a YouTube video of the tested white sands of the massive ordnance penetrator. Um, it's a fairly impressive thing, and it tends to concentrate the mind, and I think we talked about it in one of our earlier events. I, I would have that video uh, playing a lot uh, so that Iranians get, you know, get to see it, to heighten the concern that, that um, Dennis rightly pointed out, that all this investment in nuclear energy infrastructure could, could be put at risk if they don't uh, seriously begin to, to think about how they're going to exit this by uh, negotiated agreement rather than persist uh, in what they've been doing so far. But I think there are plenty we could do. In the end of the day, though, there's an intangible, I think, that's extremely hard to, to gauge, which is uh, it's obviously, from their point of view, a combination not only of our capability and Israel's capability, but also of intent. And although the administration has continued to say uh, that all options remain on the table, I think Dennis agrees with this uh, judgment. The Iranians don't see it that way. And by the way, the, the, the MOP, the massive warning of time period, was the public question that we recommended. So, was it, Dennis, do you want to comment on Eric's point? Well, I, I, I think there's no question that in terms of capability, we have a very impressive capability in the region today. Uh, and there are things that could be done in terms of exercises that would be that could be useful in terms of signaling. We've said before, I've said it before, I think being very serious about interdicting clandestine arms shipments that Iran is sending throughout the region would send a signal about our resolve and make it clear we're we're not so sensitive to any reactions when we see certain behaviors, their behaviors are what we're going to react to, and we're not going to allow the concern about uh, their reaction to this determine whether we're going to act against these kinds of behaviors or not. Uh, I was a long advocate for having uh, the demonstration of the mob go viral in terms of YouTube. Actually, when I was still in the administration, I was in favor of that. Uh, and I do think it's, it's you know, there is a hesitancy for reasons that are understandable when you're in the middle of diplomacy not to look over, overly provocative, particularly when you have negotiating partners. This is not a bilateral negotiation. We're part of a multilateral negotiation. I understand there's a concern about that. But I think one of the things to do is to talk with your partners about, look, something has to change or we're not going to have an outcome. And the outcome, you know, we cannot have an outcome where, and the senior administration, particularly David Backrider, said, if the if we simply freeze this outcome, that's not acceptable. Well. That's good. That's good. That's the mindset of the administration. The question is, now let's evaluate our strategy and see, does our strategy make it more likely that we're going to produce that outcome, meaning an outcome we don't want? And if, if we come to the conclusion that we could be headed that way, what do we need to do to revise our strategy to produce the outcome that we want? Which I come back to saying is, rollback for rollback, and by the way, apropos of Steve's point, with the maximum amount of time possible. You know, we talk. We talk about 20 years. Uh, again, a senior administration official talked about double digits. Uh, double digits need to be a lot closer to 20 than to 10. Steve, I mean, picking up on what Dennis and Eric have said, um, I guess someone said that you know, insanity is defined by doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I suppose that right. Uh, so, because obviously there's a sense here. The administration needs to change its policy. But in fairness, so does Congress, doesn't it? I mean, they've been imposing sanctions, and it's obviously I think, something we all support. But so far, it hasn't gotten a deal either. The purpose of sanctions is not to get the Iranians to the table. The purpose of sanctions is to get a deal 
that either eliminates or significantly degrades and, and destroys their nuclear program. So therefore, what does Congress have to do differently? Let me, I think another point that we put out in our report about 10 days ago was, for instance, I think congressional sanctions on, on the military option. Would that be something that's even uh, realistic for Congress to do? Let's say for one of the committees, Armed Services Committee, to even have hearings on the military option, uh, that this should be part of the debate. I mean, what different things could Congress do besides just making sanctions uh, more intense? Very good question. Let me say at the outset, though, that you know, I think um, your question really doesn't give enough credit to the sanctions uh, that, that have emerged from the Congress. Yeah. Um, I worked for 10 years with the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and I'd say during that time, which was uh, during the 1990s, early uh, 2000s, um, almost like clockwork, uh, virtually every Congress there, there would be a new Iran sanctions bill, and um, and and Patton was pretty much then as it as it has been more recently, uh, you know, whichever the whichever administration was in power opposed the the, the tightening of sanctions. Um, Congress, uh, on a bipartisan basis, uh, insisted, no, this is, this is what we want to do, and by overwhelming the margins, we would uh, adopt these, these sanctions legislation, these sanctions bills, and they would go into effect. Uh, and that's continued under the Obama administration, and, and it was Eric who observed that uh, it is interesting today to see the Obama administration talk about how effective these sanctions have been since uh, they, they opposed them uh, at the time that Congress was considering them. One thing that the Joint Plan of Action done, has done, though, is, is break the back momentum behind us, and the best illustration of that is there, you know, like Blockler, there, is, there are new sanctions bills pending before the Congress. Uh, the one that uh, seemed to have the most momentum was uh, Chairman Menendez, who was the chairman of the, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, a Democrat, uh, had a fairly robust sanctions measure uh, co-sponsored uh, with Senator Kirk of Illinois. Uh, and to me, it was sort of breathtaking, but the President of the United States in the State of the Union address this year said, I, I will veto Chairman Mendez's bill if it reaches my desk. So a pretty, pretty extraordinary way to communicate between the, the two branches of government. Um, but the President's statement had its intended effect. The sanctions legislation was stalled in Congress. And uh, I think that's unfortunate because, uh, Mike, you're right, the, the ultimate objective of, of, of sanctions is to persuade Iran to agree to an acceptable outcome. But to get there, you do need to have a negotiation. And, and I think there does seem to be a widespread consensus that the only reason the Iranian, well, the only reason Rouhani won the election, uh, he came to power with a mind that was uh, open to a possible negotiated outcome, was because of the, uh, the effectiveness of, of the economic pressure that had been brought to bear on this country. And um, I think that pressure contributed to the decision of the Iranians to enter into the joint plan of action. That, from, from our side, that pressure has essentially been taken off the table now. Is still the administration position that they would oppose any type of sanctions, even in a conditional way. Uh, you know, in, 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 I think Menendez is, is prepared to do this, adopt additional sanctions, but they would not come into effect unless there was failure by the Iranians to, to agree to an acceptable outcome. Uh, the administration has said even that kind of approach is unacceptable to them. Um, and, I, and I think that's unfortunate because I think it, it does make it harder to uh, achieve a successful uh, outcome during this, this follow-on negotiation. Uh, you asked whether there are other things besides sanctions. That have yeah, the issue is, by the way, I didn't mean to suggest I didn't support sanctions. The issue is the exclusive, almost near exclusive focus on sanctions. That's what I'm saying. Well, I, I do think you're asking the right question. What else could Congress do? Uh, you know, uh, both both uh, Eric and Dennis have talked about trying to make a military option more credible. The military option, of course, comes from two directions. It comes from the United States. It also comes from Israel. Uh, so this idea of the mob uh, and transferring that, that to Israel, uh, that is something that I think is a constitutional matter Congress could mandate. Uh, they, they could direct the president to transfer a you know, weapon system to, to an ally. And um, you know, short of that, there, there are other steps they could take in that direction to, to encourage um, measures that would enhance the credibility of the Israeli military threat. Um, the, the U.S. military threat, uh, I think uh, it's more at the discretion of the president as the commander in chief for you know, the exercises and deployments. But um, again, the, the, uh, Congress controls the budget, so it could uh, fund programs that, that uh, were obviously aimed at uh, increasing the, 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 the 
military pressure on Iran. So I, I do think that's an area that, that has been under underused, utilized, underexplored by Congress that maybe they should look at. Dennis, I'm sorry, you wanted it, and then I'll go to the I just want to. There's been a couple of things said about the Obama administration and opposing the sanctions and so forth. I would like to put a couple of points in perspective. One, the Obama administration did a very good job internationally of organizing the international community to accept and embrace sanctions way beyond what they've been before. So to try to somehow diminish that, I think, is to rewrite history a little bit. Secondly, and this is not a complete shock to other people who served in the executive branch, sometimes on the issue of sanctions, you also have a couple of audiences in mind, including your allies who you're trying to bring along. And so there may be times when your posture in terms of opposition is an opposition to show that the allies, look, we're not trying to do things that impose extraterritoriality on you, but in the end, we can't do this Congress. And so some of the opposition that took place in the Obama administration was clearly designed to manage how you brought the allies along. And so there's simply, you know, there's kind of blanket statement and these were imposed over the opposition to the administration is a little bit misleading. Uh, Ray, you wanted to yeah, I'll just to say oh. one thing about the military uh, dimensions, the military option. Uh, uh, I think I, I read every speech that Supreme Leader gives. I'm not trying to show up because they're in English. Uh, like they, they translated in English, French, or Sorry, Ray, Greek. we know you do know some Farsi. Yeah, but, <laughs> Uh, if you look at his speeches in the past six, seven months, prior to that, the way he approached the issue of military retribution against Iran by, emphasize, by emphasizing Iran's deterrent capability, its ability to react in different arenas and so on. Lately, in the two particular speeches, including the July 7th speech that Steve mentioned when he talked about 190,000 schools, he explicitly discounts the military option. He explicitly said there's no military option, and everybody knows that. Uh, that's a switch rhetorically. And if you kind of think about the rhetoric of 5 plus 1 since November, you don't hear as much about all options being on the table for a variety of diplomatic reasons that Dennis was suggesting. I want to dissent a little bit because uh, I actually don't favor a resolution by Congress saying that authorizing the president to use force, or maybe even for that matter, transferring these munitions to Israel, because that's what you do when you're about to negotiate a bad deal. That's a wrapping around a bad deal. If you want to ensure the security of your allies in the region, negotiate a good arms control deal, uh, a rigorous arms control deal. Uh, and a passage of legislation is unlikely to deter Iranians from thinking military option is on the table when it has not been on the table or the way they're thinking about it. It's entirely possible that they have miscalculated. The history of international relations is about miscalculations. But I think the best way of ensuring the security and safety of your allies and the police in general is to negotiate a good answer for you. Well, let me ask you a question, Ray. What, what do you think would convince the Supreme Leader right now? Because I've read those two speeches that anywhere he's <laughs> yes, 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 <laughs> where he was very explicit in terms of saying, you know, they're not going to attack us, which was runs counter to everything that he'd said previously. So what, from your standpoint, would impress him that the military option actually was on the table? Well, I do think that the, 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 there are two leverage points that one can have. One is the sanctions that have been talked about, but the other thing is, uh, is competing with another region. Uh, I think once they recognize that you know, we, can, we can compete in Syria, we can compete in Iraq, we can compete in the Palestinian Israeli uh, in the territories, uh, in that particular sense, this is what's been conceptually awkward about our approach to Iran, is we have segregated arms control from all other issues of concern. So Iranians can do whatever they want in Gaza, but that doesn't affect the negotiations in Vienna. They can do whatever they want in Iraq. That's not affecting negotiations in Vienna or Geneva or wherever they may be. And there's a problem with that approach, because the more Iranians engage in mischief in the region, the less possible it is that the administration's arms control agreement is going to have support at home. The president's arms control agreement, along the lines that I think they're thinking about it, uh, not part of the council, is unlikely to have a reception here, including from Hillary Clinton. What Hillary Clinton said in the Zakaria show is violation of joint final action. Joint final action does not suggest Iran will have a very, very limited nuclear research program. It suggests that after the passage of Sunset Clause, they'll have a real big, big sum program. After the passage of Sunset Clause, if Ali Khamenei wants to have 1.9 million centuries, we just nobody can stop them. 
after the passage of sunset calls, if he wants to have not one, but 10 heavy water reactors, there's nobody that can stop him. After that, if he wants to have not one enrichment facility nestled in the mountain, but enrichment facility nestled in every mountain, there's nothing to stop him. Uh, so if the administration was willing to compete with Iran in the region, I think they have a more of a receptive audience regarding our social agreement, which may be more permissive in this term. Eric, let me just make two points. One, uh, in my never-ending um, struggle to be fair and balanced, uh, I, I accept Dennis's uh, amendments to my history of the um, administration's interactions with the Hill on, on sanctions. I, I take his points on both uh, the uh, 2010 Security Council resolution, which did empower very you know, tough sanctions by the EU, and I think outside the scope of what was actually in the resolution, I think that was an achievement. But I still think that there's been something about the manner in which the administration, as Steve pointed out, has conveyed its, its opposition sanctions. I'm also aware that there's an institutional, you know, having been a creature of the executive branch for 30 years, I recognize very well what Dennis was describing. There's an institutional uh, struggle here as well between uh, the Congress's prerogatives and the President's and the Constitution's invitation to struggle over the conduct of foreign policy. I, I get all that. It, it still seems to me the administration could have more artfully played the sanctions game with the Iranians than it has. It has been so draconian in some of the public statements about the sanctions, as Steve points out in the President's State of the Union, that it's hard for me to imagine that some of this does not lead over to something else we've been talking about, which is the credibility of the President on, on the military options in the eyes of the Iranians. I mean, if he's not willing to pull the trigger on central bank sanctions, why, you know, why would you think that he would be willing to order a military strike? I think it, there's a, you know, an inconsistency, not so much in the positions they've taken, but the way that they have done it and how they have played it. It seems to me you could have played it the way, for instance, the Nixon administration tended to play the Manskin with them and, and make the Congress the bad cop and yourself the good cop. You know, this is coming unless you make it more or less. I think that's really been the, the deficiency. But I do want to come back also to something that, Dennis, you said, and Ray referred to just a moment ago, which I think is also implicit in our report in regards to uh, the need to uh, consult more fully with allies. There is a fundamental struggle going on in the region. The additional Iranian activities that we've been discussing are you know, an instance of that. And it's certainly what the perception is of the other countries in the region. For many of our allies, they believe that there's a competition going on, but only one side is competing, and that we're not competing. And so I think uh, your point, Dennis, is extremely important. It would be very salutary, and frankly, the best thing we could do in terms of managing our relationships with allies, if they had the sense that we, we were competing. So I, I completely associate myself with what you and, and Ray have said. And Eric, let me just quick follow up, and I'm going to ask everyone a quick question. Uh, Given the way that, say, the administration has handled diplomacy in recent days over Gaza, including the, the, the meeting in Paris, as I think it was reported, the one uh, Palestinian official said to Friends of Hamas conference, do you think the administration has a uh, show we're competing against Iran and how we're handling the uh, Gaza negotiations or not? Well, I really actually defer to Dennis on this because he's, he's more expert than this than I am. I think the problem is the administration is not looking at what's going on uh, between Israel and, uh, and, his, and Hamas in Gaza as part of a larger regional tableau. They're, they're segregating it out and looking at it purely in, uh, in Palestinian Israeli terms, as opposed to seeing it as part of a larger strategic interaction going on in the region. That, I think, is the problem. I think that was really kind of Dennis' point. You know what? It's very, as I was saying, it's very important that this be brought to an end, but it's also very important how this is brought to an end. By the way, for Israelis and Palestinians alike, it is ultimately uh, in the Palestinian interest that Hamas not appear that it emerges having been weakened militarily, but is strengthened politically. Uh, and it is not purely a function of the number of Palestinian casualties that will determine that. And the fact that, as I said, if you take a look at where the Saudis, Emiratis, most of the Gulf states 
excluding Qatar, and Egypt are coming from, it's pretty clear that the, the level of criticism in their press, and even in some of their social media of Hamas, not saying they're not criticizing Israel, they are, which is not a surprise. But the fact that that's emerging now should tell us something about what's happening strategically within the region. And if there's going to be a kind of guiding principle for us, for the administration, over the next two and a half years, it should be that by the end of the administration, those who have been friends of the United States should be stronger. Those who have been adversaries of the United States and our friends should be weaker. How does this outcome relate to that strategic objective? Uh, and to the extent to which our diplomacy reflects that, it will serve us first now as it relates to this conflict, as it relates to the balance of power in the region, the balance of power with the Muslim Brotherhood, but also the balance of power with Iran. How you respond to ISIS cannot be a case where our friends in the Gulf will say, gee, if we team with the United States uh, and, and the Iranians are weakening ISIS and Assad is, you know, and the Iranian Shia militias are weakening ISIS, our, the Saudis and others are not going to say, we'll be part of that if the net result is that Sunnis are going to be subjugated by Iran and its friends. So again, what are the guiding principles that are shaping what we're doing in response to each of these threats? How do we see all of these different issues in the region relating to each other? What we don't want to be doing is responding to any one of these particular issues in isolation and trying to come up with an outcome that on a narrow basis may make sense, but on a regional basis may not make sense. Oh. I'm going to ask. I'm going to act like John McLaughlin and ask predictions. Uh, the uh, two quick questions over the next four. Are we? Uh, do you think in four or six months there will be a deal, uh, a final deal, and will it be an acceptable final deal? Eric, sorry, I didn't tell you I was going to do this, but. I thought. <laughs> I would say, if I had to bet money, what we will get is another extension. Dennis? Um, I'm, I'm where Eric is. Yeah. Steve? Yeah, I think I agree with that. I, I think that's the most likely outcome, although um, yeah, I focus a lot on the Sunset Clause and, and why I think that's such a good deal for Iran. Um, I think the, the Iranians were really rationally thinking through their, their long-term interests. They, they would uh, take the offer that, that, that's there for them under the joint plan of action. Uh, but I think there probably some political considerations that make them hesitant to do that. And uh, uh, I, I do think the least likely outcome is that uh, this whole thing will collapse, uh, because I, I think uh, both sides uh, need to keep this process alive for, for their own domestic reasons. Ray, will these be talks like the Israeli-Palestinian talks that go on for years and years? Uh, it, it may happen. Uh, I, 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 I suspect uh, the Iranian red lines aren't going to change. Uh, they are where they are. Uh, the only way you're going to deal if you find some sort of a technological formula for accommodating those red lines. Uh, so this, that. Uh, if the Iranian red lines don't change, which I don't believe they will. If the American red lines don't change, which is not, not the history of this issue over the past 11 years, uh, then I think you're in the Israeli-Palestinian process, where the process becomes a purpose. And that might not be the worst of things, by the way. Uh, but if the history of this issue is what is been during both Bush and the current administration, is that when we meet Iranian intransigence, we adjust our red lines. Then there's a possibility of a deal. It, it is, it is a, a good deal for Iran, is a, a bad deal for the United States. We're at that position now. Not everybody's going to win, as the previous rhetoric suggested. It's not going to be winning. Somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose. The question is who that is. All right, as the ominous region said, uh, no deal is better than a, a bad deal. We don't have as much time. Let's take some questions. Uh, let's start with Jen, who have been the Washington Post. Thanks very much. Uh, first, for Dennis, um, I wonder if you could comment if uh, the extensiveness of the tunnels um, is 
representative of a security failure by Israel, that they didn't know that these were going on in the number and intensity. And then to the panel in general, um, have we given these things away permanently? Once you put a sunset clause on the table, um, is there any way to get that back? And once you've shifted to a position that Iran is entitled to some level of enrichment as opposed to no, um, in a diplomatic sense, um, is that irretrievable then? said, uh, I'm, a, I'm a revolutionary, not a diplomat, that applies to me. Uh, so in terms of actually negotiating things. We had always collectively, and I think individually suggested, certainly individually, I'm not sure collectively, that the, the notion of sunset clause ought to be reconsidered. Uh, and we have to go back and renegotiate that particular component of it, and maybe other components as well. But that's, by the way, Eric is, is at an ambition here. The history of arms control is American delegations going back and renegotiating various aspects of arms control that are proving unacceptable. I would say that if it's an interim agreement, I would renegotiate that. I'm not sure if there's an appetite for doing that. Thomas and Gaza are going to leave that Well, I think it's very, very hard to get it back once it's been given away, but uh, diplomats have great deal of resourcefulness <laughs> uh, that they can bring to bear if necessary. And, and uh, as Ray suggested, I think this is a case where it is necessary for uh, the, the diplomats to figure out a way to, to, to pull this back. Because there's plenty of historical precedent for countries um, getting out of the doghouse on, on uh, nuclear matters. But it's not just the it, it, it historically it's never been because just they were given a period of time to behave, and at the end of that period of time, everybody agreed that they could be trusted. Uh, there had to be some political change that went with that, and uh, you know, South Africa is a case of point. You know, yes, they agreed to dismantle their program, they, but the other thing that happened was Nelson Mandela won a democratic election, and so the international community was prepared to believe that with that political transformation, maybe uh, it, there would be a different attitude toward the proliferation. And the extraordinary thing about the joint plan of action is that there is no Except for the passage of time and good behavior during, during the interim period, uh, that's all that's asked for the Iranians. And uh, after, after that, they're being treated as a, as a nuclear nation in good standing. And um, that's, that's pretty scary, and it's really, I think, without precedent. So hopefully, the dip diplomats can find a way to do so. I think they, Steve, involved Congress in this process more as also as a way to do this. I, 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 think, if, if, I think if the Congress were heard on this, uh, yeah. they would right. be deep in trouble. I do think, actually, um, in order for the, the administration to deliver what the Iranians are expecting in the area of comprehensive sanctions relief, legislation from Congress will be required. And uh, I do think the Sunset Clause is going to be one of the issues that's uh, most troubling to the Congress and uh, one that they can condition their action on. Um, I think it would be preferable, but I think it's unlikely. Uh, I do think, that's why I said, I would like to see the double digits that administration official used, I'd like to see that closer to, to the 20 year time frame. I also believe the longer it gets, uh, it, there is a potential for a political change for the uh, I, I view the Iranian situation today not unlike the way the Soviet Union looked in the early 1980s, where there was an ideology that nobody in the country accepted except the very narrow elite they were served by. And I think that's the reality of Iran today. And I do think that if, in fact, things were able to open up somewhat more, uh, you know, close to 20 years from now, we're likely to have a very different kind of Iran. So some of the concerns we have in that regard might change. Uh, apropos of your question on the Israelis, there's no doubt that there was a strategic surprise uh, and that they had, the Israelis had no idea of the scope of the tunnels. Uh, they had no idea where they came out. Uh, had they known about it, you wouldn't have seen the readiness to accept the Egyptian ceasefire proposal. And the Israeli position changed after there were two infiltrations, and suddenly they realized that they were facing a very different kind of security problem that was a much more immediate security problem, and one that, that his bullet, uh, Hamas could act on at any point. So in the case of, historically, when you look at strategic surprises, 73 being an example, uh, oftentimes, you had the information you needed, but you had a set of, a set of assumptions that 
had you look at those, you had you look at the information through, through a certain prism. I don't know in this particular case if that was what was going on, but there's no doubt that the Israelis faced a strategic surprise uh, and now have to deal with a very different kind of security threat than they dealt with before. And I think we too should be thinking about who else is going to now copy Hamas elsewhere in the region in circumstances that may affect us more directly. I mean, whenever you have this kind of a conflict, it isn't only the Israelis who need to do a serious lessons learned in the aftermath of it. We need to do a serious lessons learned in the aftermath of it. I'd like to just comment on the, this hope that uh, the pass with the passage of time, we could have political transformation, and, and, and so we can maybe commit to things that might happen 20 years from now. Um, I happened to be around when uh, the Clinton administration cut its deal with North Korea uh, in 1994, the agreed framework, in which the basic concept was to get North Korea to give up a very dangerous nuclear reactor, we would give them two nuclear reactors. Uh, and um, there was a lot of criticism of that deal. Uh, the, the single most persuasive argument I ever heard from Clinton administration officials in favor of this, and they, it was never something they said publicly at the time, but they would whisper it, was, you know, it's going to take us 20 years. And 20 years, these guys should be gone. So we're, we're buying time. And you know, in 1994, you know, when communism had just collapsed, and, and you know, the Soviet Union had collapsed, the Warsaw Pact had collapsed. It was just five years after Tiananmen Square. It, it really wasn't crazy to suggest that a communist regime didn't have much of a future. But guess what? You know, it's now 20 years later, and <laughs> they're still there. Uh, fortunately, the nuclear reactors were never finished, but um, I don't think we can, uh, you know, uh, this is one of what troubles me about the joint plan of action. It assumes that uh, there's going to be some period of time, I, I think the outside is probably 20 years, after which Iran is considered a normal country. If they want to, if they want to separate plutonium from spent reactor fuel like Japan does, they're going to be allowed to do that. If they want to set up a, a massive enrichment capability like the Netherlands has, they're going to be able to do that. And if they want to enrich the 90%, like Brazil does, because they have a, they're trying to build a nuclear navy, they'll be able to do that. All of those things are, are given to them in this, in this joint plan of action. Hopefully there will be political transformation. In the meantime, um, I'm still waiting for it to happen in North Korea. Eric, I, I take your point, but I'd also say Iran is a real country. North Korea is not. I'm supposed to feel good about that. <laughs> 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 Again, you know, I think the answer to your question depends a little bit on the timeline you're talking about. I mean, do I think it's possible to retrieve this now in this negotiation? <coughs> no, I think you know, that, you know, now we're just, as George Bernard Shaw might say, haggling over the price. Um, so uh, what troubles me more actually than, I mean, I'm very troubled as others on the panel are by the sunset clause in this, but I'm actually more worried about the, um, What's been what might be being given away in the terms of the number of centrifuges. I mean, when you think about this, and this is really a bipartisan comment, since as Ray mentioned, this whole history goes back 11 years. You know, you know, I remember when the red line was if they actually introduced, you know, any US six, you know, gas into the conversion plant at Israel. That was the red line, you know. And then they did that, and then it became well, yeah, they can't, you know, start spinning centrifuges and, and rich uranium. And then that you know was breached, and then then it became well they you know can't have a very large number of you know centrifuges certainly no more than a couple of hundred, and now here we sit today talking about is it going to be fifteen hundred is it going to be four thousand six thousand or one hundred ninety thousand or one hundred ninety thousand swoop just so that's not correct and uh, you know I, I, those I think are things that are very hard to get back once you give them away. Give a couple, sir. Uh, Dana Marshall, a, a couple of very quick questions, maybe they're long answers, but one is uh, apropos of the question of red lines, there hasn't been much discussion here about what to me has always been a very important element of that, which is breakout time. What should, how do we defend that red line? What should that be right now? That may be one of the last resorts. The other one is the role of Egypt, uh, specifically with respect to the, the Gaza. Are we seeing a new Egypt emerged that could really become particularly helpful, not just with this, but in many other areas in the region. And that's what Steve, you want to take the issue of the breakout time? Or? Yeah. Look, 
Uh, let me speak to that, and, and maybe I'll, I'll answer that. Then I'm going, going to leave. <laughs> I apologize. I have a plane to catch, so okay. I'm not going to be able to. So we're going to conclude any. Um, the um, you know breakout time. Uh, supporters of the joint plan of action have, have pointed to some of the features of it that reduce, uh, uh, actually extend uh, the breakout time uh, potentially for for Iran, and that that's encouraging. Uh, on the other hand. Um, those who've analyzed closely the IAEA data on, on what's actually happening on the ground have detected that um, uh, the Joint Plan of Action forbids the Iranians from introducing new types of centrifuges, but they can replace existing centrifuges, uh, on, uh, repairing them, uh, make, you know, routine maintenance, uh, and that sort of thing. And, and it turns out that the new uh, uh, P1 centrifuges, the same type, uh, are about 25% more efficient than ones that they're replacing. And um, so it, it, uh, the calculations have been done over at the Bipartisan Policy Center. And you know, if that improvement is, is achieved uh, well, fleet-wide, actually. Yeah, if it's achieved fleet-wide, basically their breakout time is back to where it was before the joint plan of action. And you know, what is the definition of a P1 center? You know, we're allowing uh, Iran under this agreement to do research and development on center people. Now, maybe they'll only research and develop more advanced ones, but if for 10 or 20 years they're stuck using P1s, my guess is they're going to do a lot of R&D on how to make the P1s work better. And um, so I, don't, I wouldn't want to predict what's going to happen to uh, breakout time. Um, if if you know, over a decade or more they're able to do research and development, and they've already demonstrated that they can increase the existing models by 25% like efficiency. Yes. I would just, I'd say two things. First, the answer to your question is, in any comprehensive agreement, do we have a measure in mind of what breakout time we need, and then we work back from that and figure out what's the, what is the infrastructure they can have in terms of, of numbers or accumulated enriched materials in country uh, that will give us satisfaction that the breakout time is sufficient for us to be able to detect anything that they're doing that represents uh, you know, a danger, and we can then do something about it. And you know, I've been from the school and basically said I'd like to I'd like to push them back about to the point where it would be two years, and that has that means a low number of centrifuges, it means a ship out of accumulated material and the like. I suspect, based on the kind of things that one sees, that the, the administration might like to see that as well, but maybe is prepared to accept an outcome that would be closer to a year. Uh, so I think somewhere in that time frame is what you may be talking about. I do think you need to build into that an awareness on the Iranian side of the consequences if they do cheat, uh, and what happens if we catch them. Uh, and here again, I'd like to program it in to part of the agreement, and certainly what we would work out with the Hill. As for Egypt, uh, look, the short answer is Egypt is critical to resolving this issue. Whatever it is that Turkey and Qatar may offer, they can't touch or affect Rafa. And if the Palestinians want greater uh, access to the outside world, they need Egypt. Uh, so Egypt has to be satisfied. And I do think that this can be part of, of uh, Egypt, again, beginning to assume what is the role beyond just this issue, but others in the region. Obviously, Egypt has its own internal realities it has to contend with. Uh, and, and clearly, that's a process that's ongoing. And you know, there are some signs that are hopeful as it relates to economic reform decisions that President Sisi has made in the, in the past month that are encouraging. There are other things related to how they're dealing with um, politics that I think are still a work in progress. Uh, we have time for one final question. Rafi, if you want to. Thank you. I'm Rafi Danziger, consultant to APAC. And you already talked about the likelihood of an extension but there are some experts who believe it's much more than one extension, who believe that the administration's position is that it's not likely that it will be a deal that uh, can pass master with Congress. Uh, and therefore, and they don't want to see a collapse of the talks, which will put pressure on them to do things they don't want to do. 
and therefore they will try to keep asking for further extensions, perhaps for the duration of this administration. We're wondering what your, uh, your views on that. I won't say any of that. We'll just be very brief since we're going over time now. So. Um, Are you ready? Uh, <laughs> uh, for those who are concerned about the administration's resolution and judgment, and judgment, an extension may not be a bad thing. Because if, choice, if, if your choice is a bad permanent agreement, deficient permanent agreement, or prolongation of a deficient but manageable interim agreement, that might not be the worst of things. <coughs> okay, thank you. That was good for that. Let's take it back. I also want to just highlight one thing organizationally that we didn't, I shouldn't have mentioned at the beginning. I alluded, I don't think we have it out outside, but if you look at not bad, it was in the Wall Street Journal on Friday by General Jim Conway, former Commandant of the Marines. Oh, it is outside, good. So, uh, uh, Jim's organization took him along with uh, 11 other retired generals and admirals to Israel. One of the things we visited was a terror tunnel along the Gaza border, and I think uh, and um, that was in May. And he writes about that and, and about the conflict, which I strongly encourage you all to read if you haven't already. Um, I just want to conclude by just saying uh, our next event that we have scheduled is on September 9th. We have a lunch and briefing with uh, a new senior advisor to the Gemunder Center, uh, retired IEF Major General Yaakov Amitor, who is also a former National Security Advisor to Bibi Netanyahu. We'll have a lunch and briefing with him. I encourage you to uh, continue looking out for our emails and so on. We'll be putting out more uh, reports, having more events as uh, the Iran issue unfolds and other issues as well. Thank you very much for coming. I look forward to seeing you in the future.